The Keystone Pipeline is going to worsen the climate change crisis and it's also going to devastate nature and ecosystems. And I think that's a bad idea. Our sense, no way, not ever, not today. Our sense, no way, not ever, not today. Today, the voice of America shall be heard. The conscience of America shall be felt. What do we want? A Robin Hood tax. I work at the Institute for Policy Studies. We're a progressive think tank that's about turning ideas into action, just like y'all are doing right now. Unless we take the climate fight seriously and we put Robin Hood tax revenue into green jobs, into making our communities climate resilient, into a clean energy revolution, we're going to lose the fight against climate change. So let's tell Congress, the White House, we need a Robin Hood tax now to help us fight climate change. Bolivia's own regulations show promising signs of progress in controlling coca leaf production. So was President Evo Morales right to kick out the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration? If you want someone to stop doing something, it's important to understand why they're doing it to begin with. And previous models and other forced eradication models around the world treat these farmers growing illicit crops as mere criminals. Just stop what you're doing. But in fact, they're family farmers. And if you don't understand why they're growing these crops year after year, um, you, you, you do forced eradication and you force these families into food insecurity. We're joined now by Phyllis Bennis, fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. She's written a number of books, including Challenging Empire, How People, Governments, and the UN Defy U.S. Power. Her new piece in the Nation magazine blog is entitled Moral Obscenities in Syria. Phyllis, welcome back to Democracy Now! The United Nations Charter, which is the fundamental component of international law governing uh, issues of war and peace is very, very clear on what constitutes the legal use of military force. Is there a system that might achieve democracy, equality, liberty, community, ecological sustainability, and not destroy the planet with climate change problems? And what in the world is a system? It's amazing to think back 50 years to 1963 when two young men, Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett, both under 30 years old, were working in the Kennedy administration, saw the limitations of how policy was made and how power worked in that setting. They left and created the Institute for Policy Studies. I think that there are a lot of elements that make the Institute for Policy Studies different from other organizations. We don't take government money. We take on issues that are both domestic and international. We have a theory of social change that combines social movements and strong analysis. Public scholarship is an attempt to use the principles of scholarship in a way that engages the real world with a view to achieving change, not simply to report. At IPS, we try to combine scholarship with activism to make social change. And that means not only doing the research and the analysis and the framing, but also figuring out where you can get traction. We really emphasize making sure we're connecting our analysis with our allies in other parts of the world. We are working on ending the drug war, making sure there isn't outrageous CEO pay, you know, little things like saving the planet. What's your job? My job is changing the world. That's what we try to do at IPS. This is one of the things I've learned at IPS. Now, first of all, you need a good idea about what the world should be, which helps people contrast with what the world actually is. And it shows folks that you could have a better world, right? A brighter future. I think that's how change happens once people coalesce around a good idea. Thank you, Farah Hassan. 
I get to I get to toast all of you. So that's that's my job, and I think it's really wonderful to look out here and toast to you. And in particular, I'm going to focus in, and you're going to see on the screens 50 core allies of IPS. But first, just thank you for coming to the celebration. Some of you have been with us all weekend. Thank you for working with us at IPS. Our tagline is Ideas into Action for Peace, Justice, and the Environment. But we really couldn't do it with all of you. I would say that for our 50 years, we have been strong when we've woven our work together with the great social movements of our time that have advanced peace and civil rights and women's rights and environmental rights and human rights locally and nationally and globally. So tonight, we celebrate 50 of our core allies. You'll see their names. Dozens of you here tonight lead these organizations and we salute you. We toast you. Without you, our ideas and our facts and our studies and our films are not grounded, are not useful. Let's take a moment just to celebrate some of the great victories of the past 50 days. Forget about the past 50 years. IPS has been proud to work with allies here to achieve a number of major victories. We all stopped the military strike on Syria. We stopped a very summer strike on the Federal Reserve.
the wake of that, to set up an organization like this that is still going strong 50 years later and has dedicated itself to peace and justice, and to have this party in a train station. I can't tell you how perfect this because I have to catch the 1010 to New York. But aside from that, the symbolism of it, I love trains. Trains. I think of democracy now as the underground railroad of information. And information that comes from organizations like the Institute for Policy Studies and so many of the groups that are being honored tonight. And trains are truly revolutionary. I mean, you think about the organizing that went on around trains in this country. The greatest organizer of the 20th century, A. Philip Randolph, who organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And then went on, with Byron Rustin and others, to organize the March on Washington 50 years ago. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the thousands of conductors who were the sons of or former slaves themselves. Organizing is the answer. It is the hope. And as John said, we saw that just in the last 50 days. If you ever lose hope, think about what happened, what seemed like an inevitable march or war once again, a U.S. military strike against Syria, it wasn't just President Putin offering a plan. It was that President Obama faced such complete revolt here at home. Across the political spectrum, the idea of the U.S. engaging in more military actions than it's already involved with. It wasn't just people organizing in the streets. It was people of every political stripe because of the kind of organizing you all have done for years that said no. And so when President Obama realized his back was against the wall, he said, well, we'll do it with our war ally, Britain. Unlike the United States, the Prime Minister of Britain said he'd have to get the consent of Parliament, not thinking that there would be a problem with that, but the people of Britain said no to the members of Parliament, and so the members of Parliament for the first time in 150 years said no to their Prime Minister asking for permission to go to war. Thank you. 
thousands of Chileans and other Latin Americans and Chileans even right here in the streets of Washington, D.C., like IPS's own Orlando Letelier, the former Chilean ambassador to the United States, and IPS's own Ronnie Moffat, who were killed in a car bomb attack on September 21st, 1976. IPS has done so much to illuminate what happens when the U.S. supports human rights abusing regimes, and for that, we are forever indebted and must continue to tell these stories. Yes, John Kerry met with Henry Kissinger on September 11th. A very sad meeting indeed. If only John Kerry had met with Juan Garces, Finnish uh, Salvador Allende's, one of his closest allies, who Allende walked on September 11th to the palace door, one of the last people to see Allende alive and said, go tell the world. When we interviewed the great Spanish lawyer, Juan Garces, who continues to tell that story about those last moments, like so many at IPS and so many of you who do your work, he actually didn't want to go back to September 11, 1973. He said he wanted to talk about the parallels to today. He said, you have extraordinary renditions, you have extrajudicial killings, you have secret centers of detention. I'm very concerned about those methods were applied in Chile with the knowledge and backing of the Nixon-Kissinger administration in this period. The same methods are being applied now in many countries with the backing of the United States. That is very dangerous for everyone, he said. Rather than meeting for Kissinger, with Kissinger for advice, John Kerry would better serve the cause of peace by consulting with those like Juan Garces and here at the Institute for Policy Studies and so many of the groups that you all represent who have spent your lives pursuing peace. The only reason Henry Kissinger should be pursued is to be held accountable like Pinochet in a court of law. You know, Democracy Now! goes to every climate change summit, not for what's happening inside, but for the thousands of people that gathered outside in Durban and Doha and Cancun and Copenhagen. In just a few weeks, we'll be in Warsaw, in Poland, for the next top UN climate change summit. But I think back to a young woman a few years ago in Durban. Her name was Andre Lepadera, who was a student at College of the Atlantic who addressed the UN climate change and among the things she said, I speak for more than half the world's population. We are the silent majority. You've given us a seat in this hall, but our interests are not on the table. What does it take to get a stake in this game? Lobbyists, corporate influence, money, you've been negotiating all of my life, she said. She said, here we are, we were in Durban. Here we are in Africa, home to communities on the front change. She said, where is the courage in these rooms? Now is not the time for incremental action. In the long run, these will be seen as the defining moments of an era in which narrow self-interest prevailed over science, reason, and common compassion. She ended her speech to the members of the Climate Change Summit saying, stand with Africa. Long-term thinking is not radical. What's radical is to completely alter the planet's climate, to betray the future of my generation, to condemn millions to death by climate change. What's radical is to write off the fact that change is within our reach. It was 2011, she said, this year, in which the silent majority found their voice, the year when the bottom shook the top, 2011 was the year when the radical became reality. She ended by saying, Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So distinguished delegates and governments around the world, governments of the developed world, deep cuts now, get it done.
to getting it done. And that's the power of the Institute for Policy Studies. It's about information, it's about analysis, and it's about action. As Phyllis Bennis said yesterday in one of the sections, we've got our pens and computers on our desks, and we also have our bullhorns to go outside at a moment's notice. And I want to end in thinking about that train and in progress forward and where we've come from. And this 50th anniversary of the foundation of IPS and also the March on Washington, the woman who helped to launch Martin Luther King eight years before the March on Washington was Rosa Parks. Right, Dr. Martin Luther King was a young minister who just come to my memory. And Rosa Parks, on December 1st, 1955, sat down on the bus and refused to get up for a white passenger. You all know the story, especially you in this room. But the media got it wrong. You know, when Rosa Parks died a few years ago, democracy now raced here to Washington because she lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda, the first African-American woman to lay in state there. And then her body was brought to a church down the road. Thousands came out, and I bet some of you were there. Oprah was inside, Cicely Tyson was outside. Of course, we were outside because it's often more interesting to be outside. And we asked a young woman who was there among hundreds of people that were big loudspeakers that were transmitting the service, why are they here? And she said, she was a college student, she said, oh, I emailed my professors this morning. I said, I'm going to get an education. <laughs> and so, what did Rosa Parks teach us? And how did the media get her story wrong and get all of her stories wrong? They said that Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. That's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. But she was a first-class activist. She was secretary of the local NAACP. She worked with Edie Nixon, who came out of radical labor politics. She worked with A. Philip Randolph, who organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Rosa Parks had been challenging the racist laws for years, trained at the Highlander Center, and Dr. King, of course, was there, too. She knew exactly what she was doing. And if you were involved in social change, you will help to build a foundation. You never know when that magic moment will come. You know, a number of people had sat down in the bus and refused to get up before Rosa. Rosa herself had sat down and refused to get up. You never know when that magic moment will come. But if you're involved in social change, as so many of you are, you will build that foundation that when it comes, helps to make history, to determine the future. And we need to ensure, as all of you do your work, that we have an independent media, not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war, not brought to you by the oil, gas, and coal companies when we cover climate change, or the insurance industry, or big pharma, when we cover the issue of health care, and who has it and who doesn't in this country. We need independent media. Media is a part and parcel of all the work you do, getting out that information so it makes it easier for other people in other parts of the world to see what you're doing and you can see what they're doing. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death, anything less than that is a disservice to a, the servicemen and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have these discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they are sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. in the corporate media, but the corporate media does not reflect the majority of people in this country. So when one's asked me what I thought of the mainstream media, 
I said, I thought it would be a good idea. Because I really do think that those who are concerned about war and peace, those who are concerned about the growing inequality in this country that IPS does so well to demonstrate and even show us a path away from that, those who are concerned about climate change and the fate of the planet are not a fringe minority. You are not a silent majority. You are the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back, and you do that every day of your lives with the work you do. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Africans. Come on, sit down. Our next guest has universal appeal. He's loved by my grandmother of Caucasian persuasion in the Midwest, as well as my grandfather in Kenya. He's loved by my three-year-old who makes me listen to Deo over and over and over again on YouTube. But above and beyond his amazing talent as a singer and an actor, Harabali Fonte is a crusader, an activist, with a lifelong commitment to making a better world. He's never ever wavered in the face of injustice. From the beginning of the time of IPS till this very day, I present to you the incredible Harry Belfonte. I'm delighted to see that his energy level 
although it still is at a high pitch, he's learned how to speak a little slower. Because we need to get him to speak all the time. Thank God for Saul. Uh, Saul can read his lips and tell me what he said.
sem exasperados e as novelas and corpos greatest terrorists in the world I think when they come home you should look for a weapon and I said well we hit the target ideas and its generosity of spirit have given us a platform to be able to say and to communicate thoughts and ideas that are not easily picked up and disseminated for the rest of our citizens here. We have heard, we do good work, we have heard in the Congress, we have heard in the forums that we attend to speak about the American point of view from a very progressive base. But I do this sometimes to say things that the wise listen. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. They gave me a platform, and they gave me a chance to speak. And more importantly, whenever I go on to honor, I call any number of my colleagues down here to say, I saw this, or I heard this, and I need to have it validated. I need to not only make sure that I am dealing with the facts of what I've heard, but that you can help me the deeper nuances of what it is I would like to talk about, whether it's our adventures in certain parts of the world where the American presence is always there in a way that is not to the best interests of our humanity, and our greater humanity. We always be caught up in some destructive act with people who are aspiring for a democratic way of life, to be free, to have a chance to save us in their hearts and lives, and we have the unique capacity to keep in that door constantly shut. IBS makes sure that it's never shut that tightly, that there's always going to be a voice to be heard, a voice that if you want to dig in and hear what we're saying, be accessible. And in the large group of young people around this country that I am blessed to serve and to be serving with, one of the things that I always push is say, look, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Institute of Policy Studies. Let's put it up on the web. Let's dig in. Now, on such and such a subject, maybe you'll find the answer. They'll lead you to a place. I am forever grateful to IPS for existing. And I talk to the young men and women, especially those caught up in the incarceration system. It is giving them the frame of reference for where they say, well, where can I find out? Where can I know? What can I, what can I do to help me understand more? And every time I meet them to IPS, almost 100% of the time, I get a call back saying, hey, thanks for looking us up. I saw what I guess had to say, and this led me to a host of other uh, connections, of other moments that helped me sort through what I do not know. I am joy, joy, I'm joyful that uh, here, this time in my life, I'm standing here before you, well, I'll tell you the truth, I'm standing here with you. But,
everybody. And I guess I want to thank the leadership for the kind of guidance they've given me, the way they keep me informed, the way they never turn away when I've asked them to go in the places where they only sometimes have an expertise. They have someone always connected to leading me to the source of the greater truth about what we may be uh, wrestling with. I guess nourishes my soul, it keeps my moral center in check, and uh, those are the two things that I most need, something that nurtures the soul and something that keeps me morally on point. And the idea plays a big, big part in that. It's not just what you feel intellectually, it's not just what you know academically, Sorry out facts. It's also the spirit of young men and women, and some not so young. <laughs> Certain ideas. That one little piece of unfinished business. I had a kind of a senior moment last night. I'm not too sure how many of you were at the uh, at the uh, last night's session. And we were celebrating Saul's passing. And I got up and I had just wanted to say that I, I, I couldn't find words that looked up to me. The occasion I didn't feel it. It was overrun with other ones. It was just, and still is the way. A little emotion. Saul was a big part of my daily diet. I was telling a story about doing a film in Cuba and having to, or having had the opportunity to get a chance to interview Fidel Castro. And in order to take advantage of this moment for the film we were doing, I needed to have someone who was not only fluent in Spanish, but fluent in the subjects that I would be taught and they were able to keep nuance, to keep the subtleties of language right on point so that nothing was missed. And Saul was most fluent in Spanish and certainly fluent in the politics he shared was the perfect person to be with. And we were not quite sure exactly when we would see. Well, they just hold your hands up for the old people who were there last night. I did the story. Okay. Enough of you were not. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know how to get through this quickly, so let me, let me kind of chunk it together. Uh, when one has an appointment for that casualty, you may be told to go to see at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 10 o'clock in the morning. Usually that means that somewhere between 10 in the morning and 10 at night, you may have the appointment. Came to have, uh, I think a lot of that has to do with being smart and relationships and security, but it's also the way it is with how engaged he is with the things that he has to juggle, the things that he has to do. And often when we talk, uh, it's not always the easiest of conversations because the people like Gabriel Garcia, Gabriel Garcia, I guess, who uh, was very upfront and very on point. He would say things sometimes that uh, challenges some decision the Cuban government may have made or something that may have been said. But he always says it with a deep care and a deep consciousness that's respected. And in there we have to make sure that the, the, the power of language is, 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 is very precise. Uh, I will speak Spanish. And I can get through. But uh, if I were to say some things and I completely grasp the language, important points I could miss. So we were told that uh, we had an appointment at 10 o'clock to see the help. And uh, we were ready with camera and getting ready to set up. And uh, by 11 o'clock, we had no word. By 12 o'clock, we had no word. By lunchtime, visited a lot of friends and began to have a little run. Uh, and by five o'clock, we were feeling 
know that. Sitting down 
now to say that they not only had their own recording studio, but if you know anything about Cuba, having their own space exclusively is a huge, huge plus factor. These kids did it. Not only that, their rap, their music began to reach out into the pieces of the rest of Latin America. And I'm pleased to say that now, three of those young rappers from Cuba now reside in New York, have been married, and are their spouses, and as part of the rap community, have done a great deal to contribute to the sophistication of language and refining and setting a new course for much that's going on in the hip hop culture. Thanks to Harry, and I, I just want to say in bringing up Isaac Gu and Sarita Gupta, 
To me, what is remarkable about this moment is we have the continuity of Harry Belafonte in his 86 years young. And that experience with a new generation of leaders, we decided for this final toast to bring up two of the great young leaders of this next era, Sarita Gupta, the director of Jobs of Justice, Aijin Fu, the head of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, who built an incredible campaign during the first generation, and we're building a new style of leadership and a new way of building coalitions. And we're deeply grateful.
for the future and the soul of this country, that ideas matter. And there can be absolutely no question that the kind of ideas that come out of the Institute for Policy Studies are precisely the kind of ideas that we need more of going forward. the world.